How's everyone doing today? Good? Yeah. Uh, sorry about the delay. Uh, it never ceases to surprise me. So one day we'll only have driverless cars, right? And then everything will be on time. Uh, but till then, uh, <laughs> till then we'll keep discussing how we can get there. All right, so uh, this is who I am, and uh, you know, thanks for the introduction. What we are going to talk about today is deciphering AI. And uh, <clears throat> it's a topic that's coming up a lot more than before. When we started in this field, I have been uh, doing some version of this for the last 15 years now. Uh, no, nobody really talked about this. We wanted more and more complicated models, right, to give us better predictions. But, uh, you know, as human beings, we're never satisfied. When we got to a point where we started getting fantastic predictions, we said, hey, we don't like these models anymore because we want to know what's really going on. So before, complex was good, and now we are saying, no, complex is bad. Where do we go? So, uh, you know, the talk is called Deciphering AI. Uh, and uh, the good thing, though, is that there are certain new methods that people are coming up with uh, through research, which allows us to decipher a lot of the things that actually seem like a black box, right? Especially fairly convoluted methods uh, that we are going to talk about uh, in a bit. So it doesn't take a data scientist to know that a lot of the things that you're talking about, like machine learning and deep learning algorithms, uh, they lack transparency. Okay? We know that. That's uh, given. And uh, that's one of our biggest challenges when we try to provide the enterprise solutions for AI. You go into an analytics firm, an e-commerce firm, you walk into the Ubers of the world and the Googles of the world, everyone is already bought into the idea that AI is going to solve my problems. But the moment, as a consultant or as a faculty, I walk into a traditional company, right, and I tell them, hey, you know what? We have these very fancy algorithms that can solve you so many problems and so on. People start questioning it. That how can I trust you? How do I know that what you are saying is correct? So PwC tells us that AI is a $15 trillion opportunity. But in the same paper, they tell us that 67% of the business leaders taking part in their survey believe that AI and automation will negatively impact on stakeholder trust levels. That is extremely important to realize, that if you are thinking that you are talking of a $15 trillion potential impact on global GDP, right, and we know that two-thirds of the C-level folks don't trust what we are going to do. Do you think that actually will ever translate into a $15 trillion opportunity? It probably won't, right? Because you're going to keep facing roadblocks and you're going to keep facing hurdles because no one will trust the machine. And you know, with the Elon Musk versus Jack Ma and Mark Zuckerberg and everybody has their opinions, right? what AI is going to do for us or what AI is going to take away from us, it's becoming more and more of a very split house. Yeah? Because, see, if I, if I show someone this picture, right? this, this is a deep neural network, right? Most of you guys, you, you have seen a picture like this before. It looks fairly convoluted. Right? This doesn't look like easy, uh, to kind of figure out what, what all of these things mean in, the be in between. Right? Low-level features, high-level features, multiple hidden layers. Right? It looks complex. People are not going to trust you if you show them pictures like this and say that, hey, you know what? Using this, I'm going to tell you how to run your company. Because I know better, despite you having 25 years of experience running a firm, I still know better, and why do I know better? That is what it looks like. Nah, not gonna happen. Can't win by saying things like that. All right, now the question is, that do we care if we win? If I win the contest, 
do I care about explaining about how I won? Right? If you, you know, if you ask, I don't know, uh, Virat Kohli or any of these guys, that how did you decide to hit that particular shot for that particular ball or things like that? I mean, you know, I don't know if they will really have an answer. Most often they don't, right? Uh, you know, we had this old joke that if you ask a centipede that which leg do you move first, it will stop walking. It has 100 legs, right? It doesn't know <laughs> what moves first and what goes later. So the question is, do we really care about that if we win, right? So we have these algorithms which are nested nonlinear structures. Um, what does that mean? That means that they cannot be explained. Right? I can come up with other terms as well. And the problem right, is that we, we like experts. And uh, at least some of us are willing to trust experts as well. Right? So we know that they're rocket scientists and they can come up with very fancy mathematics. And, uh, and, and we can trust them, kind of. The problem with AI right now, or the way AI is moving right now, is that it's not just the lay person who's lost. It's not just somebody who has heard of deep learning and heard of ANNs that they are lost and they don't know what it means. The problem is that uh, you also don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. The guy at Google who built the algorithm also doesn't know what it means. Right? Now that's the scary part. That's when people get really worried that how far do we go, you know, and how much can we trust blindly an algorithm which is doing things which we cannot really understand. So, uh, so you guys have, I'm, I'm sure most of you at least have heard about AlphaGo. Everybody heard of AlphaGo? And uh, you know, AlphaGo beat the world champion 23 games to seven, uh, which is a big deal, right? It's, uh, Go is uh, mathematically a more difficult problem to solve than chess, so it's complex. And then these guys came up with AlphaGo 2.0, right? And that beat AlphaGo 1, the original 100 games to zero. And what's amazing, and I mention it in some slide later, but I'll tell you that AlphaGo 2 was trained for one day. Okay, I build an algorithm, I train it for one day, and then it beats the algorithm, which beat the human 100 games to zero. All right, so I win. Why the hell would I care whether it used neural nets, deep nets, this, that, complicated thinking, or whether uh, you know, it had a very good astrologer who told him how to win, or her how to win the algorithm. Maybe the astrologer did it. So what? Who cares? I won. Hmm? We could not care less about how it works. All right. So uh, we win in AlphaGo, uh, and we are very happy about winning. Now think about it. Uh, think about medical decisions. Right? So in the game, we win, and we are very happy, and we all say that, you know what? Some complex algorithm made it happen, we won, that's all I care. Even if I am in financial markets and I invest, right? I build a quant fund, I used to work as a quant, and we used to create extremely complex algorithms, right? Very, very complex, and this was back in the days. Uh, and, and it was a big problem trying to translate it to some of our portfolio managers and so on, they wouldn't like to trust us, but anyway. Winning is not everything because what about medical decisions? An inexplicable algorithm helps you win in a game of Go. You're very happy. It helps you win some money in a casino. You're very happy. You're very happy that it makes you win in a larger casino, which are the financial markets, as we know, or at least as some of us complain. But what about medical decisions? Rational decision making is nearly impossible in most medical situations. It doesn't happen, cannot happen. Right? especially in medical emergencies. So Gerd Gigerenzer, who's one of uh, the legends in uh, you know, human decision making, right? he uh, runs a school in uh, Max Planck Institute in Berlin. Um, uh, Gerd and his colleagues, uh, they wrote a paper about how do actually doctors take decisions? Because till then, economists and decision theorists, they had 
done surveys, looked at the numbers, and fitted logistic regression models or some other such decision tree models, right, depending on who you talk to. They would fit these models and say that, look, this is the final decision outcome, right? These were the facts given to the doctor. It seems like they use a logistic regression model. But how many of you can do logistic regression in your head? Anybody? No? no? So neither can I. I mean, I've been doing this stuff for a very long time. I mean, you know, I cannot do that. Uh, neither do doctors, by the way. So, uh, you know, which kind of talks about a very moot point here that uh, human decision-making studies are mostly faulty, right? So if there are any economists in the room, they are going to throw things at me now, but uh, I hope they don't come here. Uh, so how do doctors really take decisions? This is exactly how doctors take decisions. This is kind of when there is a med medical emergency. This is the ST segment change. This is a very small change that you see in an echocardiogram. Once they see that change, right, they essentially go through a three-step process. Does the person complain about, is the, is the chief complain of chest pain, yes or no? If no, are there any other factors at which places the person at risk, yes or no? And then, final decision in each step, regular nursing bed or coronary care unit. If there is a ST segment change, you don't even think about this part of the tree. Our traditional game trees, if any of you ever learned game theory, they have to be complete. Our decision trees, they keep expanding if we let them grow, right? We have to just chop them off, we have to prune them off sometimes. But they keep growing otherwise, right? And they keep trying to get better and better, but they don't very often. But when we actually take a decision, we take something like this, right? So when our doctor takes a life-changing decision, a life-saving decision for us, uh, do you think neural networks? Deep learning, SVM, no, none of the above, right? This uh, is, a, is a model, there's a, there's a model here, okay? So if you think that this is just simple storytelling, no. Decision sciences and psychology also have a bunch of quantitative models, uh, something that I research and I find very interesting. So this is called a fast and frugal tree. If you have not seen it, you should, right? I don't think people talk about these things too much in uh, AI conferences. But go and look up fast and frugal trees. Very, very interesting concept uh, and really emulates how human beings take decisions and therefore very fast. The good thing is that there is a package on fast and frugal trees in Python and in R now. So you can actually use it, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you would not have. All right. So now the doctor has a decision tree in his or her head. It's very simple. It has to happen in a split second. It has to save lives. As simple as that, right? So now think about man versus machine. We see that the doctors are not optimizing. We know that, right? Now Gerd has told us that doctors are not optimizing. Good to know. Doesn't matter. They save lives. We give them the slack, right? Of course. Uh, we cannot expect the doctor at that point to sit and run a neural network. It's going to take too long. I'll be dead by then, right? Now, uh, none of us optimize. We know that. Right? So there's so much literature on psychology and heuristics and biases and how human beings actually take decisions and so on. All right. If the doctor fails, what happens? Doctors fail sometimes. Right? People die. Um, they might not uh, catch certain things correctly. Sometimes, you know, it happens. Unfortunate, happens, understandable. But the justification is clear that the doctor followed these decision steps, which thousands of doctors have been following for the last few decades, maybe 100 years in some cases, and they came up to a decision. Most often the decision works, sometimes it fails, and we move on. But what if AI fails? What would happen if this was a machine? Would we be so lenient towards a machine? One machine-driven car killed one human being, and it was in every news outlet in the world. All right. Happened recently. We all saw it. We all talked about it. It was in the regular papers, and people started saying driverless cars are killing people. Yeah. People are killing people. 
driverless cars killed one person or two people. We are killing other people in accidents because we are you know, drunk when we are driving, we are not being careful, and of course accidents happen. We are killing way more. Right? So if all the cars in the world are driven by AI, so we won't have the traffic that I have to go through, right? Think about it, AlphaGo tra uh, 2 trained only for 24 hours. If I could say that, hey, Elon Musk and all such people who are trying to build us driverless cars, all the roads in the world are for you open for the next, I don't know, five days. Kill as many people as you want, but keep driving your driverless cars. It is very, very likely, right? I won't swear on it, but it is very, very likely that five days later, we would have perfect driverless cars. That's how fast this stuff is. This is really quick. If AlphaGo 2 could learn in 24 hours, running a million simulations on how to kill AlphaGo 1, right? If we give free reign to driverless cars for five days or one week, they will probably come up with a very, very good solution. Hmm? Are we willing to do that? Can we, as a culture, as a civilization, allow this to happen? Of course not, right? It's a hypothetical question. We know the answer. Even if the accident rates of self-driven cars are significantly lower than human beings, When the fatal accident does happen, who will be blamed? That is my biggest question. Culpability, and we're gonna talk about who's culpable. A Tesla car, driverless, hits someone and kills them. Who goes to jail? Who pays the penalty? Who pays the insurance? Do we have an answer? We don't. So explainable AI will uh, keep bugging us till that day. Uh, I used to uh, consult uh, for uh, a year uh, with the National Skill Development Corporation, right, NSDC. Uh, I uh, you know, worked with them on their data. And uh, one of our challenges there was exactly what all government units across the world face, that I have enormous amounts of data. You know, NSDC skills millions of people every year across the country, and what we were trying to figure out was that how best to spend the taxpayers' money. Which sectors should we spend on? Which job levels should we spend on? Uh, which states, which districts, which of these will give us optimal outcomes? from a policy standpoint. So essentially data-driven policy making. The problem there again, can government policy be dictated by AI? And more importantly, should government policy be dictated by AI? Because I might have a convoluted algorithm with millions of data points telling me that we should think of this sector in this part of the country, spending this amount of money, training this kind of people. What if that doesn't work? Who gets the blame? Right. Where does it come back to? So we need answers, not just predictions. So see, we are kind of going back to the old way. When we studied uh, these mathematical models, a lot of them, we studied econometrics, right? I, I come from an economics background, and it was called econometrics. It was using statistics for building uh, you know, on economic data, and it was very complicated. Uh, you know, tough, tough, tough times, uh, especially in graduate school. Uh, and there, as you, some of you might know, that the economist's perspective or the statistician's perspective was only explanation. It's amazing. Economists didn't like to predict things. They only like to explain things. Very surprising, right? Uh, that's why they couldn't predict the recession and all of that stuff. Anyway, uh, so now, once we have gone through the whole rigmarole of completely doing away with explanation, saying that I don't care about R squareds anymore. I only care about my predictive power, right? I care about that confusion matrix. My only friend is the confusion matrix. I don't care about R squared, right? We have gone through that process. But now we are saying that no, we may or may not trust the machines. We have our questions and we need explanations before we let 
AI take over and run our lives. So here you go. This is broadly, right, from the literature, uh, uh, a trade-off between accuracy and explainability. As you go on the left-hand side, you will see that explainability keeps going down and down and down and further down all the way to neural nets and uh, you know, support vector machines and so on. Very, very difficult to explain to people. These guys, on the other hand, my linear regression, classification, even up to logistic regression, decision tree is fairly easy. I can explain. I can tell you exactly what's going on, somebody else what's going on. But remember, this is not just data visualization. This is not building good pictures, right? And nothing against doing good data visualization. Good visuals are essential. Communication is essential, all right? But this is explaining what an algorithm uh, actually does. And the point is that explainable AI is all about people. We need to figure out, as a community, that how do I tell people out there, how do I communicate with them, not in terms of here's a wonderful visual or here's a beautiful infographic, now pat on the back and go do what I tell you to do. That's, where, that's our mindset right now. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. That's what I try to do when I meet clients. You know, I'm not going to explain to you what's going on behind this little black box that I have created, right? Here's a nice picture. Here's an infographic. Let's move on. The, the backlash has started. All right? The backlash has started. Clients are not happy with that anymore. If you are in consulting, if you are uh, you know, meeting a lot of clients, potential businesses, you will start seeing that. The clients are not happy with the answers, even if the answers are correct. Right? That's the amazing part. Yeah. So we have these engineers who are creating these fantastic AI systems. They are kind of unsure about what's going on in there. Of course, that cannot be explained to folks outside. So a lot of their secrets are inside this little back black box. Right? And explainable AI is not data visualization because it's all about people. So people, as we know, are not rational. This slide is a diff little difficult to read. I'll, I'll you know, just uh, outline it a little bit. People are not rational. We have already established that. We know that, right? The entire field of economics is literally, uh, I don't want to say too many bad things about economics, right? Uh, people will get upset. Uh, but, but the entire field of economics used to depend on the rational man hypothesis, right? Uh, rational person hypothesis, that if human beings were rational, then their demands would look like this, and their supplies would look like this, and their behavior would be this, and they would have an indifference curve, and so on and so forth. In the last 30 years, we have learned that that's all nonsense. Daniel Kahneman, uh, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize by saying that human beings are irrational, right? He's a psychologist, won a Nobel Prize in economics. If you follow his work, uh, if you don't, please do. We know that people are not rational, and they have or they take decisions based on certain mental shortcuts. Right? So if explainable AI is all about people, if it's all about human beings, then we, as AI professionals, need to understand that how can I communicate with people? We cannot show them the mathematical details of a model and explain to them what's going on. That won't work, right? Because people don't think like that. This is how people think. Representativeness. They think that if something looks like A and behaves like A, it must be like A. Right? The anchor. What does anchoring mean? What that means is that you, know, you get a first piece of information about something, anything. Right? You get stuck to that. When we were young, we were told first impressions matter. Right? That's a bias. As human beings, we believe in availability. Right? That's why what happens, value stocks, pretty much always give you lower returns than growth stocks, always. Why? Because value stocks are bigger, they're better names, everybody knows about them. The first stock that comes to your mind when I say the word stocks, which stock? Tata, Reliance, something like that. Right? If you ask the same question in the US, it would be like you know, Google, Facebook, right? AT&T. 
three, five, ten companies. Everybody thinks about them. Why? That's a, that's a bias in our heads. It's very easily available. So these stocks trade very differently than other stocks where you can actually make money. It's very difficult to make money trading Tata Motor stocks or Reliance stocks because the whole world is always looking at them. Right? What new analysis would you do to make more money? Nearly impossible. Yeah? So these kind of biases are common for human beings, but the good thing is that there are explainable AI strategies for each one of them. Right? And there's a significant literature uh, that's kind of growing right now. So uh, when I saw this kind of work happening on explainable AI, and there are some people who we have been talking about this for some time, uh, my friend Indranath Mukherjee, who heads uh, analytics at AXA Excel, he talks about this a lot, right? So uh, we were you know, discussing these things. So I asked him and I saw in his talk and I was wa wondering, who, who pays for this? Explainable AI doesn't make money, right? What people don't realize is this is the only thing that potentially will make you money. Because if you cannot explain your models, nobody's gonna give you work anymore after a point. So there's a huge financial impact on companies on consultants, on AI professionals, but it's not direct. So that's why if somebody asks me that are you, gonna, are you willing to spend some money on building a product, I might say yes, right? If somebody says that are you gonna you know, be willing to spend some money on R&D for a new algorithm, I might say yes. But if somebody says that are you willing to spend some money on building something on explainable AI, I would say no, right? Because I won't see that translate into cash flows. So who's paying for this research? DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's a research wing of the American Army. DARPA is paying for this research. Now, why, can you guys tell me, hearing about, you know, about this for the first 20 minutes or so now, why does the CIA and the US Army want to explain AI models? It's very sinister, I think. Uh, this is being recorded, so uh, I, I will be careful about what I say here. But yeah. They want to sell the weapons. They want to sell the weapons. How would you sell weapons by explaining AI? Yeah, yeah you know, I, I have no doubt that they are trying to sell weapons to everybody all the time. Right? I mean, uh, <laughs> but how would you do that by explainable AI? Close enough. You have a point too, don't get me wrong, but yeah. Transparency. Yeah. Leads to what? Fear. Okay, fear. Okay, okay, sure. Correct, correct, correct. Right. Uh, <laughs> Ultimately, it comes to selling. No, I think it, it, it does come to selling in some ways. I think it's even more uh, sensible in some ways and unfortunate. Let's say, and you probably were closest to what the question was about. Uh, uh, let's say I am the US Army and I uh, shell a place. I think that there are terrorists in a cave, and I get my drones to attack that, and a lot of people die, right? Unfortunate incidents, uh, sometimes, sometimes fortunate. We might kill terrorists, we might not. Now, unfortunately, what happens sometimes, right? Again, it's become rarer and rarer with more and more advanced technology that innocent people die in these attacks. If a general is called up by the Senate or by senior army officials, or by the global community saying that you attacked or you dropped a bomb, you killed 30 people, and instead of killing terrorists, and it has happened a few times as we know, you killed school children, you killed a wedding party, right? How do you explain that? The traditional answer was always intelligence failure, right? 
intelligence failure. Every government does this, right? I'm not just blaming the US government. Every government in the world, that's a part of the government's job, right? It's getting recorded, amazing. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about one of my biggest clients. All right, great. Uh, but they do that. This is part of the game, right? We all know that, and it, you know, it's kind of glossed over. It is what it is. Now, today, I am not talking about intelligence failure. I cannot, because AI told me to go and rob that bomb. AI told me to go and attack somebody. AI told me to shoot that person, right? So as a general, I cannot go in front of the Senate saying that, oh, you know what? My machine, my black box algorithm told me that I should kill these 50 people because they're terrorists, and oops, sorry, they happen to be school children. Your career's over, you're dead, you're done, right? You're never gonna be in the army again. Not gonna happen. That's why the army really needs to know. And similarly, again, this is probably a fairly sinister way out there motive, but governments need to know. Governments cannot take decisions based on AI without knowing that what is underlying your artificial intelligence models, right? So, of course, uh, you know, we are in the midst of what the economist terms as tech clash. It has already started. If you saw this video about a couple of months ago, where this driverless car was carrying stuff and going in Arizona and people were throwing things at it. Right? People are actually throwing things at it. People are upset. Right? Think about Ola and Uber. Everybody's talking about Ola and Uber, the Ola and Uber mindset, right? Uh, well, uh, we'll, not follow, we'll never talk politics here, but think about Ola and Uber. At the end of the day, they are significant employment generators right now. Nobody can deny that, right? Good employment, bad employment, we can debate that till the uh, you know, cows come home, but, uh, uh, but employment generators. If we have driverless cars, right? In the United States, one of the largest professions in terms of headcount is driving, right now. And all these people will get unemployed. Do you think all these people will be very happy about the technology that we are all working on? Of course not, right? We know that. Right? So as technology becomes more all-pervasive, we need to start explaining. It's not just about interpreting that, OK, you know what? Here's a prediction. These are the additional factors that I used. This is how I interpret things. We will need to explain every step of the way that if somebody actually got hit by a driverless car, what was behind all of this, right? The problem, of course, is that the definitions are challenging. Depending on who requires the explanation, explainability can mean absolutely different things. Okay? It can be very detailed, showing the individual pieces of data and decision points. It could also refer to a system that writes summaries for the end users. So one approach that we all use to explain AI or AI models, and we're going to talk about actual libraries and things like that, right? Uh, you know, I've been uh, in the industry for 15 years, but I teach, and I still sit and write code, OK? If you don't change, write code. It's fun, right? Uh, but, uh, but so we'll, we'll talk about code. We'll talk a little bit of mathematics and talk, talk about code. Um, so we have the top-down and the bottom-up approach. The top-down approach are for those who are not really interested in the gory details. And then there's the bottom-up approach, right, for three problems. Uh, this is particularly useful for engineers who must diagnose and fix the problem. So we're going to go into tech speak right now. Uh, I, I cut down uh, some more of the equations that I had initially put in. Um, but of course, if you want, feel free to reach out to me uh, for the references, because uh, the, the thing about explainable AI is that this is not visualization, this is not communication. A part of it is yes, part of it is communication, it's human comp computer interaction, which in itself is becoming a discipline right now. Uh, this guy at Max Planck right now, uh, the work that he's doing is called machines in the wild or machine learning in the wild. Just Google it and you will see the kind of work that's being done by anthropologists, sociologists on human computer interactions. As 
data people, uh, we, we think of these things as very touchy-feely, right? Not science. Uh, I think if you keep that mindset, it's gonna come back and bite us in the backside. We need, to, we need to talk to these sociologists right now, yeah? So this is a very traditional way of doing explainable AI. It's called sensitivity analysis. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the thing inside, as you all know, is a partial differential, right? So the point is that I do not care about the function. I do not care about the actual mathematical function, which is within FX. What I do care about is the change in fx due to a change in x, right? That how does my outcome variable or how does my predictions change based in different changes of the feature set? <clears throat> how sensitive it is, right? How sensitive are my predictions due to a change in my feature set, okay? Fairly traditional way of doing things. But what's amazing is that the most, what we can very clearly figure out that the most, the, the output which is most sensitive to a particular feature is the most, most important feature in itself, right? So the most important feature is the one which affects the output the most. Yeah. Very simple way of looking at things, but useful, right? And we do this kind of analysis every day. It's, this is becoming common, uh, common coinage, right? But now, what we're doing is we're taking a step two, right? We're going ahead and doing something which is called layer-wise relevance propagation, LRP. These are used often to understand feed-forward neural, feed neural nets, uh, LSTM models, uh, bag of words, and so on. What this does is that these LRP uh, type problems they redistribute the prediction function backwards, right? I have a feed formal neural net. I'm gonna take that, and I'm gonna redistribute that function backwards using certain local redistribution rules until I get to a relevant score for each input variable. So a variety of input variables, right? I'm gonna try and figure out that which one of these are most important, and the way I'm gonna do, uh, do this is kind of if you have seen these, you know, uh, backward induction type problems, right, in game theory. All right? So instead of moving forward, I'm gonna keep back going backwards, and what my relevance score will tell me is that it's gonna give me a measure of relevance for each additional variable added to the model. Now, if you ever studied statistics or econometrics, you would say that, hey, this kind of looks like my stepwise regression. Right? How come you guys have a new term for that? Similar, yes, similar, no doubt about that. The only difference is that I can use LRP decomposition not just for regression models, I can use the same things for image classification as well. Right. Simple use case, uh, XAI in finance uh, becoming extremely popular. And one of the reasons for its popularity is the European GDPR. Everybody heard of the GDPR, right? Uh, the Data Protection Act. It has something called right to an explanation. So if I go to you and ask for a credit card, and you refuse me a credit card, I can ask you why. This is unprecedented. This is unprecedented. And this is essentially, again, going back to the same part. If you have looked at a logistic regression, if you have looked at a linear regression, we had these wonderful coefficients. We knew the size of the coefficient, we knew the p-values of the coefficients, we knew whether they were negative or positive, all nice, right? And then all these neural net stuff came in, and we couldn't explain to our clients that what it actually means. Now GDPR is saying that, no, you have to explain. You don't have a choice. You cannot tell someone that my AI told me that I shouldn't give you a loan. You have to tell the guy that why, okay? So, how do we improve explainability? First thing to do is, of course, algorithmic generalization. When you think most machine learning engineering is applying algorithms in a very specific way, can we take that algorithm and generalize it, okay? Instead of looking at very specifics, can we broaden the horizon of an algorithm? This 
way of building algorithms, not just applying them, right? Definitely helps interpretability. But then the problem with that is that I have to again start from scratch, right? I have to start building new algorithms. As all of us know, that we would rather steal code from Stack Overflow right, than try to write our own. There are realities of life, right? So of course, yeah. I, I, I teach and, and I consult. I know how it works, right? All right. Uh, of course, deeper controlling and understanding from a corporate perspective, from a business perspective, you need fairly strong control um, and understanding of the data. Now, let's say you do have a good understanding of the data, but and you come up with a regulation. Like, there are certain regulations which are variables that you cannot use in a model, right? In the United States, one of the things is that you cannot use race in your model, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, the problem is not about that, right? That is a great regulation. Of course, you do not want your models to have a racial bias, understandable behavior, right? Um, uh, when, when you're pricing car insurance, you cannot uh, have a gender as a variable in the United States, right? It's not, it's not acceptable. You cannot have gender as a variable. Uh, you know why that one is correct. You know why, right? <laughs> Do you know why? Because on an average, women are far better drivers than men. In the US. Everywhere in the world. <laughs> I knew this would happen. I have the data. See, this is the difference between human thinking and machine thinking. I think like a machine. I went to the data and I found out women on an average are better drivers anywhere in the world. Anywhere, bar none, right? If you look at the accident rates, they are better drivers. You talk to any person on the street and tell them this, they'll say it's impossible. Why? No, it's human bias. It's not less data, it's human bias, right? It doesn't matter, numbers, who cares about the numbers? It's covered in your numerator. I'm talking about rates. Not number of accidents, rates. I'm talking rates. Look, I know my data, yeah, come on. I'm not, uh, in front of 100 people, you think I'm gonna be giving you data which is garbage, yeah? Uh, no, come on. So, credit scoring model, which is trained using a data set that includes people's postcodes, right? So I have a model which doesn't include race, but I have a model which includes location. And as we know, in many, many parts of the countries, minorities live in certain locations. So I'm being indirectly racist as opposed to being directly racist, right? These are the kind of problems that businesses would need to control, okay? Because someday, even if ethically they think, you know what, it's good for the business, it's terrible, you shouldn't be doing it, but they might think that, but one day the regulator is gonna come after you. They're gonna look at the numbers and you, they would say that you do not give minorities mortgages and you'll get into a serious trouble if you're a bank, okay? All right. The easiest way, of course, is feature importance. This is the var imp function, which we have run on random forest models since we were children, or since you were children, I'm much older than that. Uh, the var imp model didn't exist, nobody talked about random forest when I was doing this stuff back in the days. But feature importance, uh, very useful. Uh, here's a random forest classifier on peer-to-peer -peer lending data, which uh, my students were working on. The, a very, very good data set, by the way, if any of you ever want to use it. The peer-to-peer -peer lending data, the peer-to-peer -peer industry open sources a lot of their data. Our students did a lot of work on this, uh, so I know that data in and out. So this is a, you know, a random forest classifier on peer-to-peer -peer lending data to classify which loan applicants would actually get a loan. Okay. Um, here's the feature ranking. Does it make sense to everybody? Everybody can understand that? No? Yeah, neither could I. Of course, and then they came up with a picture. So, you know what, you couldn't understand the numbers, here's the picture. What does the picture mean? It means nothing. All right. Okay. So, of course, my students are smarter than that, right? They wouldn't stop there. If they did, you know, they would get into a lot of trouble with me. So, what I said is, why don't you guys try out local interpretable model agnostic explanations, LIME. This is this and the next two, they are the next big thing. If you are implementing AI, if you are working with machine learning models, go and do yourself a favor. Go understand Lime. Uh, go learn about Shapely values. Uh, Lloyd Shapely, game theorist. We keep going back to the game theory, right? Uh, and, and, and you will see that there's a lot that's going on and it's easy to implement 
because there's a library in Python, right? So you're just gonna <laughs> run with that. What Lime provides is that it can explain the predictions of any classifier. It doesn't matter what the underlying model is, whether it's a random forest or an XGBoost or any classifier, it can come up with explanations by doing what we talked about in LRP, try out different permutations, drop one variable, try another one, keep doing that over and over again to see the difference between these variables and also within their classes. That's the big one. Var imp gives me variable importance. It doesn't give me class importance. What is the actual size of the difference if, uh, or in prediction, if you move from low income to middle income, middle income to high income? What's the final impact on the prediction based on income ranges, right? My var imp will not tell me that. My var imp will tell me income is important, right? And this is the scaled importance. It will not tell me what the class level importance is. Lime would tell you that, okay? Lime models develop an approximation of the model by testing it out to see what happens when certain aspects within the model are changed, okay? So this is Lime in action. This is a part of the Skater framework in Python. If you have not used Skater frameworks, uh, really useful and you can implement line directly. So here's my context, right? Why a model predicted a person will earn more than $50,000, right? The prediction probabilities are $50,000 or less is 0.3, higher than 50K is 0.7. What Lime has done is it has broken that down to all the possible variables and the different tranches within those variables. So if marital status is less than two, right? Uh, if country is equal to less than 39 hours per week, greater than 45, if occupation rates are so on, yeah, four minutes, okay, yeah, and so on, right? So Lime really splits that up. The output kind of becomes very intuitive, just like a decision tree, right? This looks like a very de decision tree-like output, but this can be the output of a random forest by using Lime. Of course, we have deep lift, which is the new thing about uh, deep learning. But back to cooperative game theory, shapely value, okay? What shapely value does is that it gives the average marginal contribution of a feature value, okay? So the unique thing about shapely values are that they are fairly model agnostic. You see the data is directly feeding into my shapely value score, right? SHAP, that's the library that we use. And the model outcome is also feeding in and it's providing me with an explanation, right? This is output from uh, uh, you know, partial dependence plots with Skater and partial dependent plot with SHAP. What this tells me in this model is the marginal impact of a model with other things remaining constant for those particular variables. Okay? This level of detailing, these are the kind of pictures uh, that clients are asking for now. They want this level of explanation. Right? How would hours per week or how would age actually impact my income level? I need to know that. Okay. All right, uh, packages in Python, we have Lime, we have SHAP, of course, varim functions and the Skater framework. So can AI X AI, right? Can AI explain AI? That is the next step, that is the holy grail, that's what we want. We are so lazy, right, that we will get AI to explain AI so that we are out of the situation, right? Uh, so that's what's happening right now. But remember, the key here is that yes, AI will X AI uh, up to a certain point. After that, the human element needs to come in and that's uh, uh, probably your job, right? So the thing now, and, and I see a bunch of younger folks uh, in the audience, is that the next generation of data scientists, I mean, we are getting old and jaded, right? Uh, but the next generation of data scientists really need to understand this, that your core data science fancy models will only take you so far. Even your data visualization is interpreting the models. But if you really need to explain AI to folks out there, you would have to take these next steps. We are, we are you know, at, at Jigsaw, the, the program that I run with the University of Chicago, uh, we, we are incorporating this. So we are building a new, you know, advanced AI DL model and uh, module, and we are gonna incorporate this as a part of our curriculum because we, we think that you know, this is going to be a differentiator in the next 10 years. 
If you cannot explain your models, you're not gonna, you know, data visualization or infographics are not gonna cut it. It has to go back to something which looks like this, that every feature needs to be explained uh, to the potential business. All right, we have about a minute for questions. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Are these methods all statistical methods? Uh, n uh, no, not always. Some of them are pure statistical methods. Some of them come from cooperative game theory, like the Shapley value. Uh, line and such, they are in itself machine learning algorithms. Okay, because, uh, so I, ha I was working on this thing uh, since a year now, mm -hmm. and we were trying to figure this out using reinforcement learning, and can yeah. we take this to this yes. level using RL and? Yes, yes, Th and that's happening. That's happening. Now people are using deep learning to explain deep learning. Yeah, that's happening right now. That's, a, that's the next big thing. As I said, can AI explain AI? That is what the new research is, that can I have AI and psychology get together to a point where it can explain AI to the next gen? Yeah. More questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Here. Mike, please. I mean, I so you were talking about the bias that gets introduced in the AI models. Yes. So how can we ensure that our models won't learn the bias of the Correct. world, or Correct. maybe unbiased view of the biased right. world? Right. 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 How do I unbias my model? And yeah. again, this see that's the beauty of explainable AI. Right. Uh -huh. If you can explain your model biases, if you can explain that how the model actually works step by step, you can figure out that these are the points where the model bias starts seeping in. Okay. If you can see that within your 10 hidden layers, right, uh, you have three layers, and what each one of them mean, and there are three layers where bias is creeping in, you can actually stop that bias from feeding in. Right? So that's, that's what XAI is going to do for you, absolutely. Sorry, yeah. So this okay. one last question, in the interest of time, uh, we can... Two, two of them, I'll, I'll take right. both, yeah. Yeah, Please. I have uh, two questions here. So okay. The one is, uh, how related is it to the uh, Microsoft AutoML, which is like, you know, it generates, uh -huh. it, it looks on the metadata of the data know, and yeah. creates a combination of algorithms, which, uh, you know, basically uses the features. Right. Right, so yeah. you're doing the other way after the modeling, Correct. so it's before modeling. Correct. How Correct. relevant is it? The second question is, are you trying to make the business user learn more AI using ah, this? Ah, okay, so both very valid questions. Uh, uh, the first part is how AutoML is related to that. Uh, we are trying to unengineer AutoML, right? Whether you're gonna do AutoML or not, AutoML is just, look, it's a hit and run, right? It's gonna be like you know, tr trial and error. You keep trying it a million times and something will work out. Uh, it's still at that phase. It's getting more and more intelligent. Uh, explainable AI is kind of trying to do the opposite. I'm gonna explain every step of the way instead of trying a brute force method. Whereas we have moved towards brute force. So that's the key difference. What was the second part? Oh, can, am, I, am I asking people to learn more AI? Uh, in the businesses, absolutely. Not through explainable AI just, right? This is kind of watering it down. I, I teach a lot of corporates, right? Uh, uh, across the country and uh, otherwise. And, and that's one thing that we are definitely, I mean, explainable AI, I think, adds what you rightly mentioned, right? It kind of adds that. It gets people hooked. That yes, I can actually see the value. Your, your consultant doesn't come with a black box and say random forest and walks away from the room. They actually shows you a picture which tells you exactly what's going on. I'll take that one last question because I know that you've been... Uh, uh, yeah. I'm trying to understand better your point on generalized algorithms for XAI. Is that to say something like a prune tree has lesser features, so it's simpler and easier to explain? Uh, so part of it is, of course, model parsimony. As it's parsimonious, the better it is, right? For sure. So can I, a lot of the problems uh, that we solve now, we become, we take our uh, models and we make it more and more specific, very, very cornered, right? Uh, and that's what we are trying to move away from, exactly. I mean, whether it's through model parsimony, whether it's through creating generalized forms of the same problem, uh, if I don't need random forest, uh, and if it's giving me within a 5% range of statement with a simple decision tree, go use the decision tree because it's easier to explain. 
What did you mean when you said that we would have to completely change the algorithms that we have already written? Is it to say the deep uh, neural networks uh, are extremely complex? Uh, and, and neural networks are extremely complex, unfortunately, yes. Uh, but, but can we, uh, you know, can we take very specific models for specific use cases, right? Once you get into the domain, that's what happens. You get, start building use case specific models, right? Building on an existing layer of, let's say, neural nets. Uh, and that's where my complication, that's what I have a problem with. That I'm taking generalized forms of the model, making it very specific. Interesting. So, 